Today's lecture is going to be on the elbow, forearm, wrist, and hand. Uh, and just to show you, it's, uh, I didn't write the curriculum, but it's super interesting that we have spent four weeks talking about the toes, ankle, hip, knee, and really four and a half because you had that shoulder. And then we're about to spend 30 minutes on this. So what is this picture and why am I highlighting this? Well, this is the homunculus. And this shows you how much of actual brain space is used to control different parts of the body. So when you look here from really the hip on down, look at that small section compared to the hand. The hand covers as much area as the elbow to the toes. And I just find it fascinating that we spend very little time on this. So I'm just gonna tell you what you need to know for like the exams and the basic things like that moving forward. But highly, highly, highly encourage you to get a better understanding of the hand. Uh, maybe even getting into a market where you're a hand specialist. Uh, Cause as you can see, where do you think the bigger market is? Right here, one thing does all that, right? So um, just something to think about. Now let's get on to those notes. So if you don't know this by now, I don't know what to tell you, but osteology is what we're covering first. We gotta know the bones. So I wanna point out here for the elbow and forearm. So these things kind of going together, but they're two separate joints. We're gonna have the humerus. That's our key uh, bone between the two. We're gonna have the ulna, which is going to ulna and humerus are gonna help us with our elbow, but also the scapula. And I have Y on here, so you can think about that, and I will tell you in a minute. And then for the forearm, we need to erase on the ulna, it's the ulna and the radius. A lot of times people add the humerus into the, um, the forearm, is incorrect. The humerus, I mean, kinda is there, but really what's happening is it's, a, it's the joint between, it's the ulna and the radius when we're defining it. So let's take a look at why the scapula first off is a part of the elbow. So notice this insertion point here for the triceps on that ulna. Well, where does the tricep or where do the tricep muscles uh, originate? Well, if you look here, it originates on the humerus if it's the lateral head, but the long head originates here at the, inf um, the infraglenoid tubercle. So the bottom of that glenoid fossa. So we should be able to remember that the long head of the bicep is the supraglenoid tubercle and the triceps are the infra. So then thinking forward about an injury, there was uh, some shoulder injuries we talked about where the biceps would uh, be in play. We need to think about a shoulder injury, and I think I barely mentioned it for what would be the injury where maybe we need to take consideration for what's happening at the elbow because of the triceps and their insertion point, depending on what injury that patient has. So we have that shoulder again, uh, the humerus, humeral head, move out of here. Let's go to this, that's the picture we need. All right, so looking at that humerus. So uh, we should understand the proximal portion. Let's look down distally. So some big ones to remember here. We have the capitulum. This is where the radius is going to rotate around or spin around here. So for making the forearm, the capitulum is the part of the humerus that matters. Let's go over here to the forearm. So here's our radius. So the fovea of the radius, or the head of the radius, is going to spin on the capitulum there to some extent. But really what it's spinning on the most is the ulna right here. Let's make it a little darker right here. And the radius is held next to the ulna by the annular ligament. Now that's for the forearm. So then to make the elbow, 
we're going to have the troglia, part of the humerus. And I know at quick glance that it's going to look concave. And it is. However, compared to what you have here on the ulna, where it's going to conjoin in the olecranon process, fossa, this is more concave. So that is our concave portion of bone. When the ulna moves, it's the concave on convex. So going back here, some other things that are gonna matter. We've talked about the coracoid process back with the shoulder. That's where the short head of the biceps is gonna be. So it's also important when we're dealing with the elbow uh, that the short head is also being considered connecting with the coracoid process because it's gonna help with elbow flexion. We talked about the supraglenoid tubercle already, for the long head of the biceps. And then I just mentioned earlier about the infraglenoid tubercle for the long head of the triceps. Now we get down to the actual joints and I talked about this, what the, how we're defining these. The humerus and the ulna or the humeral ulnar joint is our elbow. So we have our trochlear notch and trochlear. So back over here, I call it a lecranon fossa. I'm totally incorrect on that. The lecranon fossa is on the humerus. So if you flip over here, the back side of the humerus, this is where your lecranon is going to go into. So the trochlear notch is this right here. Trochlear notch right there goes over the trochlea, trochlea, sorry. And we talked about already the humeral, humeral radial joint, the humerus and the radius, where you have the capitulum and the fovea, uh, but that's more part of the elbow because that radius needs to be able to move also. But we consider when we're talking about elbow flexion, this is pretty much what we're talking about here. This joint is required, but it's not a specific joint that we really, really talk about. With the radius, we then get into where we're at the forearm for the radius and ulna. Those are the two bones that really give us that motion that we're looking at at the forearm, our pronation and supination. So now just like with the knee and the foot and the hip, there's all different types of angles. And for the elbow, we need to look at the cubitus angle, also called the carrying angle. That should be about 15 degrees. So it's called the carrying angle for a reason because it allows you one, to carry things beside you without it bumping into your leg as you're walking. So it helps with walking. But also I would say a good discussion to be had because I believe that pretty much everything is we've evolved to do is to run away from being food and to be food uh, or to get food. <laughs> so we're trying not to be food or we're trying to get food. Also, we have enough energy to uh, procreate. That's it. So if you stand in the anatomical position and then flex your elbow, where does it land? Go ahead and do that right now. It should land pretty close to your mouth, right? It's to feed yourself. If you were straight on and you look like, or you look like cubitus veris here over on the right C, you would miss your mouth. You would have to move your head side to side. The normal cubitus angle of 15 degrees allows that hand to go right to your mouth. And if you have too much, you're gonna miss and go to the other side of your face. So that angle plays two important purposes. One, of course, is for actual carrying. If you miss that, it's in the name, that's crazy. And two, to get food to your mouth the most efficiently. Now, we look at this, this is valgus. Let me erase this here. 
valgus is technically, it's not just the knee or the hip, it's anything. And valgus, really, when you see the word valgus or valgum, what it's telling you is the distal end, so if we look at the elbow, the distal end is your radius and ulna, is lateral. And if it's varus, then it's medial. So you have a varus over here, moving over. So you can apply that to anything, to any joint. Valgus just means the distal end is lateral and varus means it's medial. So you can apply that to the MCP joints of the hand. You can apply that terminology anywhere. So we're gonna to have to have ligaments that resist those forces. So we're gonna have, now, and this is where we need to define, you know, you need to know what joint you're talking about, but the MCL at the elbow, also called the, um, the ulnar collateral ligament, because this is your ulna here. And then the LCL, which is also called the radial collateral ligament. So depending on how that's worded. So the lateral, or I'm sorry, the medial collateral ligament is going to resist the varus or the valgus force. So a valgus force would be moving this way, pushing the elbow this way, stretching this here. So the MCL resists valgus force. And then the lateral collateral ligament, uh, of course, is gonna resist the varus force. Now we'll go ahead, since we're here, let's go ahead and just talk about a pathology. And that would be Tommy John surgery. So this happens a lot of times in throwers, specifically pitchers in baseball, where there's reconstruction of the medial collateral ligament. Due to pitching, uh, the nature of a lot of pitchers, they put a lot of stress on that ligament. So that is a pretty common um, surgery. And honestly, sometimes people are actually getting it done before they even have an injury because pitchers are actually pitching better after that surgery. So we talked about the annular, whoops. When I do that, we talked about the annular ligaments. We talked about MCL, LCL, head of the radius. Uh, you can take a look at this, the interosseous membrane. Um, this is between your radius and ulna. It's a membrane between those two, and it helps absorb force. So take a look at that part of the book. It's uh, interesting. Uh, understanding how force is distributed throughout our body is important to understand how things wear down or, of course, how we get injuries. So arthrokinematics for the elbow, for flexion and extension, here you go. No need to go over these. Pause here, write them down. Those are gonna be our answers. That's for flexion. So you should be able to do the same thing for extension. Not gonna spend time on arthrokinematics since we've done it quite a bit. All right, so major muscles to look at. We've talked at nauseum about the biceps brachii. We need to start adding these nerves in now. So now we have the musculocutaneous nerve. We need to know if there's damage to that nerve, what are all the motions that could be adversely affected? We need to know that. We need to know the insertion point and understand how the biceps gonna help supinate the arm. We should understand passive insufficiency of the bicep. How, what is its passive insufficiency position? So, whoops, one, it needs to be extension of the elbow, two, extension of the shoulder, and three, pronation of the forearm. That is going to be our passive insufficiency. That's the opposite of all the actions of the bicep. That's how we find our passive insufficiency. And then of course we should understand the triceps. I'm gonna skip down here real quick. Radial nerve for the triceps. Radial nerve also upper top right here, supinator. So easy test question. If there's damage to the radial nerve, can we still supinate? The answer is yes, because the musculocutaneous nerve is available, allowing the bicep to supinate. 
You should also know the passive insufficiency position of the tricep, going back to that guy. So we've talked about supinators, elbow extension, elbow flexion. Let's look at pronation. So pronation, you're going to have the pronator teres. It is the strongest pronator, and it's innervated by the median nerve. And pronator quadratus, also median nerve. But your big ones are your pronator teres. Okay? That should always be your best answer for the prime mover for pronation. Some muscles over here. Let's take a look at that pronator teres. Okay. So this is the anatomical position. This is why it's so important to understand that the motion is not, when you pronate and supinate, the wrist is not involved and technically it's not the elbow, it's the form, it's its own joint. So with any joint that you have movement, you have a bone moving on another bone. So what is moving? It's the radius is moving on the ulna. The radius is gonna go from here and flip over. So when you're supinated and then pronate, so if you do that at your desk, I'm gonna share my screen. So you can see my face here, supinated, pronated. Yes, my hand moved, but the only thing that moves is the radius is on the lateral side right now, and it rolls over this way to pronate. That's it. That is our pronation. That's what's occurring. So that's why, like on the MMT, I'll talk about how what you need to push on is the radius. Not the wrist, not the hand. It needs to be on the radius. Some pathologies. So we're going to have that ulnar nerve, and that's going to run down that ulnar side of the forearm and down the humerus. That's your funny bone injury over near that medial epicondyle. We already talked about Tommy John surgery. Pulled elbow syndrome. This picture in your book shows a kid getting pulled by parents and a dog. Uh, the radial head dislocates from the capitulum or the annular ligament is uh, affected. Um, and it comes away from the ulna, so, but the radial head becomes dislocated. And obviously it affects kids a lot, uh, a lot smaller. So those forces that you don't think are strong definitely can dislocate those kids. You think about parents holding their kid's hand and jerking them over to get close to them. Obviously not the best idea, right? Now also, it's kind of, and a lot of these things are so close together so they can be talked about really at any spot. But a Coley's fracture is a distal radius fracture. And when that happens, if you're falling on an outstretched hand, it's technically a Coley's fracture because the displacement of the radius is posterior. So if you fall hands first, your radius would move towards your face. Now, that's posterior because it's based off of the anatomical position. If you moved back to anatomical, your radius would be going behind you, thus posterior. Uh, elbow flexion contracture. Uh, it's important that we try to get that full elbow extension, just like with the legs. Uh, we want to have our knees not in any type of contracture or our hips or our ankles. Same thing with the elbow. And I'll tell you what, honestly, one of the hardest areas, just this is totally anecdotal, um, <laughs> one of the hardest range of motions to get back that I ever worked with were some patients that had been in uh, a brace for their elbow and trying to get that elbow extension back was pretty brutal. It was really hard. Okay, now let's move a little more direct to the wrist. Guess what? Osteology, a lot more bones involved in this. And you need to know them. You need to know the order. How to find them. Because you have to palpate some. All right, so here we go, looking at the wrist. So we have our radius and ulna for perspective here. This is going to be a left hand 
This is a left hand that is supinated. So looking, you're looking down at your left palm for this. So we definitely need to know the scaphoid, lunate, trichretrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. You must know those. Those are your carpal bones, okay? This is why this is the radial carpal joint. I understand the ulna is right there, but they're defining it as this area is where the motion is really occurring, okay? Right here where it has this tubercle, this is your Lister's tubercle. So that'll be a palpation you got, probably on an exam. So these eight carpal bones make up with conjunction, with joining at the radius, our wrist. Whoops, I was wrong about that with the Lister's tubercle, not this here. Uh, that's gonna be on the dorsal side, so the back of the radius, so this is incorrect. Sorry about that, I got ahead of myself there. Not the Lister's tubercle. We'll talk about that in the lab palpation. So, because uh, you can even see here, that's why you write your notes down, on the dorsal radius. So not on the palmar side. So Arthur kinematics um, for our wrist. So going back to that picture. So um, we have ulnar and radial deviation, flexion and extension of the wrist. So we have four motions. I did a video for flexion and extension. I did not show ulnar radial deviation. We'll look at that in lab, real easy. Check it out in your Goni book. but the carpals are considered the convex part of this joint. So you should be able to see and notice here how the radius definitely is more concave, okay? So when you're doing your arthrokinematics, think of the radius as your concave bone. Now there's a lot of muscles so do your best to learn some of these, just build one at a time. But what's nice is their origin is all, is all in the same spot. So our wrist extensors are innervated by the radial nerve, all of them, okay? And they originate on the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. So if you're standing in anatomical position, you should be able to find that lateral epicondyle. And you can extend your wrist and you can feel those muscles all the way up there. Okay, and that's where you're obviously going to get a lot of tennis elbow, specifically tennis elbow is extensor carpi radialis brevis, but there's a lot of other muscles there and they all get irritated, especially when we're at home clicking on the mouse all the time. <laughs> so, and then our wrist flexors, they are divided up a little differently. Um, you're going to have the uh, radia, uh, all the radial side is on. Uh, going to be the median nerve, and then ulnar, uh, ulnar side, the ulnaris ones are going to be the ulnar nerve. So if your palm up towards you, so you can see your face, the radial fl uh, flexors are going to be your median nerve, the side of the ulnar are going to be your ulnar nerve. Everything though on the back part of the hand and the back of the arm with the tricep are always gonna be radial. So wrist extension, elbow extension, always radial nerve. And with wrist flexors, we often call this golfer's elbow, and that's on your medial epicondyle. Also, a lot of rock climbers get this. A lot of wrist flexion, finger flexion, obviously, holding on. So we need to make sure we can palpate those spots pretty easy. This is a lot of pathology we get in those areas that need work. And then for the wrist flexors, is what's called the tendinesis effect. This is the ability for your hands to flex without the wrist flexors moving. So I'm going to unshare or I'm going to share my screen again. So this is important for spinal cord injury patients, for example. If I take my hand just like this, I'm going to extend my wrist, and you naturally see my fingers and my thumb here come together. That's because a little bit of the tightness in my wrist flexors. So this effect, the tendinesis effect, can be used for someone with a spinal cord injury to pick things up or to utilize tools. 
So it's important that we don't stretch that if we're trying to maintain that effect. Now, otherwise, you can stretch it. But if it's being used, if the patient's using it, we need to think about that with splinting, bracing, positioning, and how we would exercise with this patient. So some pathologies at the wrist, we're gonna have carpal tunnel. So let's just take a good look at that picture. So the carpal tunnel is on the palmar side. Your transverse carpal ligament runs across the top. So you got the transverse carpal ligament right here. And if you notice here, the median nerve runs right under there. And you have all these different muscle tendons and sheaths, all this stuff going on. There's a ton going on in here, just like up at the shoulder. In fact, there's more going on. Well, depending on you know the amount of space and all that you're arguing here. But regardless, there's a lot going on there. So if the median nerve is being impinged, now you're gonna to start to have symptoms. Symptoms that go into, and depending on who it is, depending on what book you use, but I'm not gonna ask you this, but the middle finger could be split down in some books, and then everything over here is the median nerve. But I can guarantee you, it's gonna be the thumb and the index finger is where you're going to at least have some tingling going on. Whoops, that's part of that median nerve. Okay, so any change in sensation in that area, median nerve entrapment or carpal tunnel, something's going on with that median nerve somewhere. It may not be at the carpal tunnel. That's one area for entrapment. It could be up the chain back towards the neck. And of course, we'll talk way more about that next term. So you think about people on the computer, another one, I mean, people are at home a lot more or people who work in the office, your hand is often extended a ton when you're using that mouse or the keyboard and you're just compressing that area. So you start to get those symptoms. And look in those labs because there's a lot of special tests uh, for the shoulder, wrist, forearm, all that stuff that I've not talked about because it's in the lab packets uh, where I have the links. Make sure you're checking those out. And if you don't have those, please ask. So we talked about carpal tunnel, and then we need to talk about the thenar eminence and atrophy. Now this is severe carpal tunnel here, but the thenar eminence in my picture here. So if this is your right hand turned up towards you, the thenar eminence is the thumbs fat pad, okay? So I even have that highlighted over here. And you should know which muscles for at least one test question are in the thenar eminence. And then the hypothenar eminence is the other side. Okay, but like I said, at least know these. You should know what this area is, but I wouldn't worry about the muscles unless you're an expert at everything else. Otherwise, know the muscles for the thenar eminence and understand where that is. So atrophy, so shrinking of these muscles here, is also a very big sign of some issues with the median nerve. All right, it's our carpal tunnel. Now let's get to the hands and fingers. The most complicated area for our joints and we're gonna spend like five minutes on it. <laughs> so um, again, with the hand, you still have the carpal bones, but you also have now you know, in the hand itself. Uh, but we're gonna add those metacarpals and the phalanges. So let's go look here. So there's a lot going on here. So if we're looking at the carpal, metacarpal joint, that's right along here. If we're looking at the MCP, metacarpophalangeal joints, we're looking here. And then we should be just like with the toes. So we have the phalange. So at the thumb, just like the toe, you have your IP joint. So it's not distal or proximal, it just is what it is. And then let's go up to the index finger. You're going to have your proximal and then your distal. Okay, so your DIP and your PIP. So try on yourself to find your first MCP joint. 
So I think a lot of times people get confused on the first MCP joint and then their carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb. So make sure you can palpate that on yourself. Arthrokinematics, same deal. The MCP joints are considered concave on convex. So if we go back and look at these. So our MCP joint, if you flex, if you make a fist, what's moving? This is moving. These bones, your phalanges, and they are clearly concave. And the metacarpals are convex. So think about that when you're doing your arthrokinematic questions. So that first carpal metacarpal, so you need to be able to find that, is a, uh, for the thumb is a saddle joint. It's super mobile and uh, per the book, um, <laughs> It has the most surgical attention of all joints due to osteoarthritis. Now, whether or not that's true, I, I'm assuming so. The book has it, but um, that's what it says. It's super mobile and super important. If you think about what really separates us from so many other animals uh, is our thumbs, our ability to grasp objects, uh, which allows us to then make tools. I find, honestly, I could spend hours talking about it, but I find it fascinating to think about, you know, once humans, uh, you know, or our ancestors, our ape ancestors were able to get off of our hands and not walk. We freed them up to do things, uh, which make tools, use them for defense, climb, like anything. So um, it's really, really fascinating. I find the hand to be super awesome. And we'll talk all the time when you're using manual techniques or doing stuff in therapy or in life, we should all be giving our hands a lot more TLC, really. So think about that next time you're just, you know, punching something or slamming your hands down. It's like, dude, like these suckers are awesome. So we talked about the thenar eminence area. We talked about the hypothenar eminence. Lumbricals. So these guys do two things, and they like to offer you trick questions on an exam about this. So the lumbricals are the card holding hands. So if you look at me up here in the corner again, they do this. So they flex the MCP joint here, metacarpal phalangeal joint, and then they extend here on that proximal PIP. So they extend here and then they flex here to allow you to hold a deck of cards, I guess. So this is the motion the lumbricals do extend and then flex here. Okay, so we should be able to think how to stretch them. Theoretically, we would, which I mean, hardly anyone, unless you've had a hand injury, you're not gonna need this, but you're gonna extend the MCP and then flex. your PIP. Those are your lumbricals. Ulnar drift. Uh, with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, things generally try to or end up drifting in the ulnar direction. So I don't feel that it's necessary personally uh, to really stretch anyone into more ulnar deviation or force that uh, because we're already going to have a natural propensity for that to happen. So um, I, think, I think I have a picture of that. You think about all day, all your life, all the things. No, I don't have a good picture. Well, yeah, I do. There you go. Look at that ulnar drift there. Now, obviously, this is a pretty severe case. Everything's drifting to the ulnar side, including the wrist will do that as well. But right now, pick up a cup of coffee, pick up a glass of water. What motion are you resisting when you're holding the glass of water? And I'll share my screen again. See this? I'm holding this glass, my wrist wants to go into ulnar deviation. Everything we do is about when we're holding stuff generally out in front of us. You don't hold things upside down, right? With your shoulder internally rotated, pronated arm. No, you don't. You hold it up like this. So our radial deviators are getting a ton of work. We're close to wrapping this up here. Uh, then we got our swan and boutonniere and 
the tunnel of neon. So you know what? Here you go. The hook of ham ain't. You should be checking those carpals out. Another reason not to slam your hand down because you can affect the nerves here. So your ulnar nerve and artery can be affected here with this. Look a little more into that. I want to take you over to the swan neck deformity. See here how I have it defined with its PIP or DIP positioning. Easy test question or two about this guy. So with the swan neck deformity, at the PIP, we have extension. At the DIP, we have flexion. And then at the boot, for the boutonniere, it's the exact opposite. We're going to have flexion at the PIP and extension at the DIP. So you should be able to identify those by basic definition. And that is a quick and dirty on the elbow to the tip of the fingers. Now it is time to study for your midterm. Study for success. It is cumulative. I said it is cumulative, but it's heavy on the upper extremity because you've not been tested on the shoulder, elbow, forearm, wrist, and hand. More questions come from the shoulder and elbow than it does the forearm, wrist, and hand. Those questions are still there, but we need to make sure we know all of that information and we know and remember the things that we've already learned in the past because it is cumulative. So remember that. And if you haven't already, please make sure you subscribe to the page. It makes it a whole lot easier to get there. And then if you click on the bell, then you can sign up and get notifications every time I post a new video. So you don't have to wait for announcements in class. So you can just go ahead and start watching stuff as you want to learn. So you'll know exactly when I post. Otherwise, have a great day. Enjoy those hands. TLC.